good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Holloway, and it's my great um, pleasure today to uh, introduce our speaker, Karen Dewisha. Um, it would be a pleasure even if I hadn't met Karen before, but actually she took a course of mine at the University of Lancaster over 40 years ago. <laughs> you were too. It's just one of the, great, the, the greatest pleasure for a teacher is, of course, to see one's students do really wonderful things. One, then, one can then claim credit. I don't actually claim credit. <laughs> but one likes to think one can claim credit. Um, but this is, uh, so it's a particular pleasure uh, to see you here, uh, Karen. And uh, Karen is the Walter E. Haverkurst Professor uh, in the Department of Political Science and the Director of the Haverkurst Center at um, first Russian and Post uh, Soviet Studies at Miami University in Ohio. Um, she's been there since, uh, I think, for the last 15 years. Uh, before that, at the University of Maryland, she has her PhD from uh, the London School of Economics. Uh, and she has been a consistent uh, and steady and insightful um, uh, writer on, uh, on Soviet foreign policy and then very much on the breakup of the Soviet Union and the states that emerged from the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, she and her husband, Adita Wisha, who's also a professor at Miami University, uh, was also a student at Lancaster, um, is a great specialist on Iraq and on the Middle East. Uh, so, and that's been a very productive uh, partnership. But the reason we... Um, the particular reason uh, we invited um, Karen to come and speak here uh, now is because she recently published a book which has received a great deal of attention, uh, Putin's kleptocracy. And the title of our talk today is, Is Russia a kleptocracy? And if so, who cares and so what? Um, so what is always the standard question in political science seminars or job talks. You give a talk and then someone says, well, so what? <laughs> so we, we're looking forward to the answer to that. <laughs> the, um, so it's, um, it's not only a very timely book, it's actually a very important book. Not only the insight it gives into Russia today, but it also makes us think and rethink uh, very much the collapse of the Soviet Union and post-Soviet history. And it's a very important <coughs> stimulus to our rethinking of that and the conclusions we have to draw from it. So welcome, Ken. Well, I think that David Holloway does deserve credit, in fact. I think he deserves both credit and blame. <laughs> because, you know, I was also interested in, I don't know, the politics of the south of France would have been a nice career turn. <laughs> but I can, I can definitely say that, you know, having a, a class with David all those years ago, and indeed they were probably 40 or more, um, you know, you, 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 you get exposed to the idea that this is a very fascinating space, endlessly fascinating. And it was fascinating back then, and it's still very fascinating. <laughs> um, and maybe one would want to, to wish the politics of that country on its people 40 years ago, and I think we're at the same place again. So I've, I've uh, decided to call this lecture is Russia kleptocracy and the reason that I did that is because I wrote this book on Putin's kleptocracy and I thought I'd said everything that was to be said about it and then I got a couple of I mean many great reviews but I also got a few reviews from people who said okay so they're corrupt but it's not a kleptocracy so I'm gonna just once more from the top uh, just say what do I mean by that? What actually do I mean by saying that a system, a, a political system, is a kleptocracy? So what I mean when I say that is 
in order for us to say that a, a system is a kleptocracy, I'm talking about a system in which risk is nationalized and reward is privatized. So if you think about uh, an investor in the United States wanting to create a, a, a corporation, he has both the reward and the risk. He has, absorbs both the reward and the risk. Now, of course, we all know after 2008, there were companies that were deemed too big to fail, and their risk was also nationalized. But we might wish to believe that this isn't a standard practice in the United States. And within this general uh, system, only those loyal to Putin enjoy the benefits of this rule. Their risk is nationalized and their reward is privatized. It certainly is not the case for many hundreds of thousands of small or medium-sized business owners in, the, in Russia who are subject to this raider, ra raiding by those above them that they benefit from this rule. Property rights are secured by loyalty and not by law. Uh, they could go and they could take their claims to court, but those court decisions are political and are phoned in often, not always, but phoned in often. And so the market as such, something that Putin always talks about, in fact is hugely distorted by political considerations. There's no transparency. I mean, you know, a lot has been written about the system now as Politburo 2.0. I yearn for the Politburo in trying to figure out what's going on in Russia. There are no Thursday afternoon meetings. We don't know when decisions are made. There is no, uh, there is no Alexandrov column in Pravda with all the kind of criminological um, um, way of talking that allows the elite down there and us in the West to understand what is the possible direction that the regime is going on. There's huge lack of certainty, both in the West and in the elite itself, about what is uh, Putin's view on anything on any given day. Tribute is very important in the system. It's a pay-to-play system from the bottom to the absolute top and loyalty and silence are demanded in return. So those are some of the basic view, uh, my, my basic views about the nature of the system. I think that the system began in um, the period 89 to 91, that the KGB and the conservatives within the um, political, within the Central Committee saw what was happening in Poland, Hungary, and then in East Germany and became extremely frightened about the unreliability of Gorbachev to actually secure their future. They worried that something crazy might happen as happened in Poland, where a multi-party system was introduced. They would have to, the communists would have to run as one of many parties and that they would be wiped out in the elections, <coughs> as happened in Poland and Hungary. And of course, in East Germany, <laughs> the country was wiped out. So it was very bad scenarios. Um, and we have documents, and the documents are cited in my book, about the ways in which they started to move money abroad along established KGB channels, because after all, the KGB had been funding national liberation movements and communist parties illicitly since the 20s, so they had established channels. Money was moved abroad, it was kept safe, for the Communist Party in the event that it became an unfunded, um, legally bound party in a multi-party system. What happened instead was after the 1991 coup, the Communist Party was entirely outlawed. So that Communist Party money that had been put abroad now didn't belong to the Communist Party, but the KGB knew where it was. And so conflict and contention started amongst these KGB groups as to who had, who had knowledge of where the money was. And while we, and I, I say we very advisedly because I'm certainly 
um, one of these people. While we talked about the failure of the 1991 coup, the failure of the efforts by the conservatives to oust Gorbachev, in fact, I think it's a much more complex situation that some of them were quickly tried and put into jail, but for very short periods and very few people were actually arrested, even though this was a nationwide um, conspiracy with many regional leaders um, ha ha having been <coughs> told to be in preparation. And there are some people in St. Petersburg who believe that Putin was one of those people who was told to be prepared. Um, that 1991 failed as an incident, but the effort to, for, to return the kind of KGB preeminence and the ideology of the KGB as a protector of the grand Russian idea remained, and it became part of the project of bringing Putin to power in 2000. So 91 failed, but 2000 succeeded is one of the basic arguments of my book. And that's not to say that in 1991 they knew who Putin was and that Putin was the guy, because there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there were KGB people, particularly from First Directorate, who were put in uh, parallel um, positions as deputy mayors and so forth with other Democrats, Sobchak being the Democrat in St. Petersburg, but there are other cases, and that this older generation of uh, KGB generals, not Khrushchev, because for a year or two if he was in prison, but the ones who were not in prison, put people in and got them prepared, and, and Putin is the one who rose to the top ultimately in the end. That's my argument. <coughs> so that they laundered money, they kept it abroad, first for the CPSU and then for themselves. In the book, I detail, first of all, I've just, I just skipped like three chapters of the book, but that's fine. So in the book I detail the many cases that I investigated in St. Petersburg of Putin's involvement with illicit activities, illicit groups. Putin's, my, my basic argument is as follows. Putin, and not only Putin, but Putin, as deputy mayor in St. Petersburg, worked with the mafia to make their activities legal. He, he was in a position within the government to provide license and registrations, and both for items going out of the country and for items coming into the country. He sent over his signature Tambov Mafia leaders as members of cultural delegations to Germany. The, how many here have been to St. Petersburg? How many have been there for White Nights? Okay, so White Nights was a, 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 a mafia front. So from the very beginning, there were people involved with uh, cultural exchanges and with other things like gambling and so forth, that where you expect the mafia, but with cultural exchanges who were at that time and have remained very close to Putin, who were using their position for taking goods and services out and for bringing goods and services back. Because even in 1991-92, that border wasn't open for people who had a criminal record. So he verified for their applications for visas that they had no criminal record, when in fact somebody like head of Tambov Mafia or head of Malishov Gang had had um, not only been arrested, but had in, in one case been convicted for at least one murder. And yet he was on delegations to West Germany to sign contracts with orchestras and violinists and so forth to come and perform in the uh, White Nights. So that's all, in, uh, all, these, all these cases are in the book. But in, in the book, I spend a lot of time talking about a very specific document. This document came out in, was leaked from the presidential administration in early 2000. It was written in late 1999, and um, there's all kinds of evidence for that because it, it contained drafts of ukazi that were supposed to be issued in early January 2000. And it's a um, multi-page document 
the portion that was leaked purports only to be part of the document, but the portion that was leaked and which is on the website for my book, and you can just Google it and you'll find it, uh, and I translated it into English, and it's there also in the original Russian, talks about the functioning of the presidential administration going into Putin's first term. And so here is his team, one can imagine, you know, meeting in multiple meetings in dachas and everywhere else, talking about how they're going to come to power and what kind of actions they're going to take. And they have sections for every single office. What is going to be the function of every office of the presidential administration? What is their public or open function? And what is their closed or secret function? So, for example, these are a couple of quotes from, from this. All the special and secret activities to counteract the opposition will be entirely in the hands of the special forces. 1999. Uh, those who publish articles about corruption in the Kremlin, who sling mud at the president, will receive the same treatment. So they knew that corruption was a weak point from the very beginning, and they wrote about the strategy that they were going to use to uh, go against the free press to deal with it. So they had this document, and they also had people who were willing from the very beginning to enforce this point of view. And here's a couple of great pictures. You can see what has to be one of the most unflattering pictures of Putin <laughs> here in the background. And this guy, this is Sobchak, the mayor of Mos uh, St. Petersburg, and here is Viktor Zolotov. Viktor Zolotov was one of many in Putin's entourage from the KGB who were actually senior in rank to Putin. And I think this is something we now have rather forgotten, that he was not the most senior person in that circle. <clears throat> Viktor Zolotov formed with Roman Sepov a private security company called Baltic Escort. Now imagine this. I know this doesn't happen in Palo Alto, so I'll just use Chicago as an example. <laughs> Imagine Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, saying to the Chicago PD, guys, I don't need the cavalcade, the motorcade. I've got my own people. And they're going to go with me to all meetings. They're going to be my security. And we're fine. We don't need you. And Zolotov and Sepov provided security for Putin and for Subchak from a very early stage, despite the fact that there were probably no less than 100,000 Ministry of Internal Affairs and former KGB people all in, in place in St. Petersburg, in their organizations. So Tsepov had been in 10th Directorate. He had been in the Personal Protection Directorate of the KGB. He's a, a real guy when it comes to knowing how to deal with people. Here he is again, here, in this very interesting picture from Nova Gazeta in 2004 at the funeral of Tsepov in St. Petersburg. This is a very interesting picture because, okay, his partner died, so you expect him to go to the, the funeral, right? But here, Here in this circle are the leaders of every mafia gang in St. Petersburg. And in addition to that, Sepov had died in 2004 as a result of poisoning. Of course, that's not in his death certificate, but according to his father, who was a pharmacologist, professor of pharmacology, uh, of poisoning, which led to him uh, losing all of his hair. And this was two years before Litvinenko was, was poisoned in a similar way in uh, London. Uh, Tsepov 
and Zolotov were not just the head of Baltic escort, but they became very important to the Putin regime. In 2000, during the wonderfully produced inauguration, first uh, inauguration of Putin, when he emerges chrysalis-like from the gilt doors that are open and you've got that, you know, Roman Orthodox blue behind him and he comes down the, the aisles all alone and there are, you know, flunkies on all sides who are reaching forward to shake his hand. What people don't, didn't notice is that when he was inaugurated and turned around to come back, Zolotov was at his side and was named from that moment onward as the head of, his, of Putin's personal security detail, what we would call the Secret Service, but his personal security. And so to send someone like this to the funeral of, of someone like Tsepov, who was also known as the producer, not only because he produced jobs for St. Petersburg allies in Moscow, but also because he actually liked to produce films that he was able to appear in, something that our own mafia uh, share with him. Uh, it shows you what kind of person this, this is and what kind, of, what kind of person Putin would be that he would actually bring into power as his personal bodyguard someone who was reputed to carry the Chorny Nal, the black cash for Putin's skim in the gambling um, industry in St. Petersburg, a portfolio that Putin requested and received from Sobchak. Here is uh, Zolotov again in 2000. This is Zolotov. This is Morov, who is in charge of the, uh, the nuclear suitcase. And then these two on the right are, um, how many of you are watching The Americans? Yes. Uh, are, are, one of them is in charge of the resident, residentura in New York. And what um, Zolotov and Murov didn't know was that the head of the New York resident tour in 2000 was soon to defect to the United States and wrote a very interesting book. Well, it's, a, it's an extended interview. There's first person in Russia and then there's Comrade Jay in, in the U.S. This, this guy talks about what was discussed at this meeting and says, of course, it's one person's point of view. I mean, this is what he reported. It may or may not be true. But he said that Zolotov and Murov had told them, because they're obviously all you know, KGB, former KGB, that they had been critical to bringing Putin to power and that they had certain plans to eliminate people. But the list was so long, they decided that not even they could kill them all. Now, you know, there are people who talk like this in every country, and maybe they do and they don't do that. But I think it is very telling, and it, for those of you interested in the subject, Comrade Jay is a very interesting book. It's very telling that here you have somebody who is in the secret services saying that these two people, Zolotov and Murov, who are in the Putin, protecting the Putin circle, are thugs. And this very much is part of the conflict that we see, I would say, today in the in the um, post in the killing ap after the killing of Nimsov. A lot of criticism of Zolotov. Zolotov remained as head of the presidential bodyguard until 2014, until he was named by Putin as the ministry of interior deputy minister in charge of all Russia's riot forces. So any post Bolotnaya uh, riots, demonstrations that need to be put down, now Zolotov, the person who was running black hash for Putin in Petersburg 
in the early 90s is in charge. I think it's extremely worrying. Uh, Putin disappeared after Nemtsov uh, was killed for 10 days. Zolotov did too. And the first time we knew Zolotov was back was when we saw Kadyrov's Instagram, which I'm su assuming some of you follow, I do, uh, Instagram, and there was Zolotov with Kadyrov. So it's a sign that, you know, there are real forces um, around Putin who are not just the new nobility, if we could use that term, of the FSB. So who cared? Or who cares? Well, obviously Boris Nemtsov cared. And here he is in a picture presenting uh, one of his last reports, not the last, but one of his last reports, which was his very in-depth uh, analysis of the cost and the level of corruption in the awarding of contracts for the Sochi Olympics. We all know the number of 50 billion. And that number is a Nimsov number. We wouldn't have that number. We wouldn't have that analysis without Nimsov. He sat and did the contract work to, to, to find out who amongst Putin's top circle the contracts were going to. He also wrote uh, reports on Putin's lifestyle. A lot of the information we know about watches, yachts, palaces, the personal details of Putin's um, obsession with accumulation come from Nimsov. And just in general, details about the top elite and their um, economic interests come from Nimsov. Came from Nimsov. So who else cares? Well, I'd say um, these days the, the U.S. and E.U. care. And they care uh, a lot, not because they don't love money flooding into their banks, but because at, after the uh, forcible and illegal annexation of Crimea by Russia, they had to do something. And, and I think it is interesting for those, those of us who started out studying Soviet foreign policy, that instead of me, meeting tete-a-tete -tete, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Sixth Fleet and the Soviet Fleet, they're not, they didn't do it this time. So you didn't have, uh, for many reasons, our naval troops going through the Dardanelles into the Black Sea. Instead, what they did was to announce U.S. Treasury sanctions. We've kind of accepted this as like, oh, they're sanctioning. But you know what? That was a big deal. It was a, a huge departure from our the way that we've dealt with Russia in the past. Um, and not only was it a huge departure, but it was a the fact that they announced them, the Treasury Department announced them by saying that the, that the criteria for who they chose was their connection to a senior Russian government official. I mean, they didn't put Putin's name there, but everybody, and of course especially Putin, and those people who appeared on the sanctions list understood what they were talking about. And so, first the United States, and then a little less willingly, but gradually, the EU, for understandable reasons that we can go into, um, now, I think, do treat Russia as a kleptocracy. They, 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 it's become part of policy. And for those of you who know what Jackson Bannock is, was, or what sanctions on Cuba are, you know that once the Department of Treasury, Treasury Department gets its teeth in, it's going to be a long time before these sanctions are lifted, for better or for worse. Now, the so what question. Well, it matters that, a country, that we understand the way in which a country's politics is structured. It matters that we understand what the motivations of any group of leaders might be when they take certain decisions. Um, and so, it, 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 when we call... Um, as, as do some people within the discipline, when we, when we call Russia a fascist state, 
it matters that we understand what that word means. I don't, I'm not one of those people. I'm much kinder. I just call it kleptocracy, because <laughs> it could be so much worse. You know, it matters that they could be motivated by narrow, craven, personalistic motivations, as opposed to the big eye of ideology. So it, it, it seems to me that it, it's more likely that if you regard a country as a kleptocracy, that you can get them to back off using back channels, sanctions, searching for money, and so forth. But it also matters for us, because you can't understand British foreign policy without understanding the extent to which Russian money uh, floats the city of London. You just can't understand why it is that the Cameron, it's not just because Cameron is weak, ineffective, um, clueless, <laughs> uncaring. No, it's more important than that. It matters because he is actually understands what's important to him and the Conservative Party, that he doesn't touch the, the money pots. So when Britain was, under, was trying to figure out how to deal with uh, a, res, a response to Crimea and the U.S. had imposed sanctions, one of the members of his cabinet arrived at number 10 with his documents, his talking points in full view, and that document was, uh, a photograph of it was taken by a document paparazzi, and there are such things, and then blown up and, um, in, in the press, and it said, the number one interest of Britain is not to do anything with our Russia policy that would undermine Russia's position in the city of London. So that's the number one objective of, of, of the UK. We need to understand that there's a huge impact on the West when uh, a sovereign government, and of course Russia is not the only country uh, doing this, but in, uh, one of the biggest, a sovereign government is willfully contributing to the black economy in the, in the entire globe. If you calculate as to people who study globalization and financial flows, that one half of all money at this point in time in the world is circulating in the black zone. That's not in the interest of the sovereign state system. And that money is, is circulating both because there are nice Americans whom we all love and who endow buildings at Stanford or anywhere else, um, who want to avoid taxes and go to the offshore zones quite legally to put their money there, legally from the point of view of American law. But they, in Russia's case, they want to avoid Russian tax, but they also want to avoid the call from Putin which says, I have a charity that I want you to contribute to. It's called All of Agriculture. And we want, we want some of your money to come back, and we want you to give it back, we want to, you to de-offshoreize. If you have your money legally abroad, then everybody gets to know how much money that is. If you have your money illegally ab abroad, then you both get to avoid tax in the host country and in the sending country, as well as hiding the money from the person who might call and ask you for a donation. And we know, uh, I've interviewed many of them for this book, that there are many people sitting in London who really don't take calls from Russia anymore. It's just too expensive. They cashed out. I mean, I think one of them, to a certain extent, is Roman Abramovich, but he also has his other protections. Uh, but some of the people who fled Russia because they didn't, uh, uh, who who were given a a who were given a contract for the Olympics and told to build some building or another and fled to London, did so because they couldn't afford to actually build the building 
for zero money because the cost of the kickback was 50%. So they were being asked to build that building as a favor to the regime while the regime was, individuals in the regime, were themselves taking a kickback. And so they just left. So the, the, uh, back to the impact on the West. You've got this problem that the more money that flows in and the, the greater is the number of, of individuals in the West who are earning their own keep through the receipt of uh, fees and ownership interests in tax havens, the greater will be their own lobbying to keep these loopholes open. And we can imagine that um, Delaware, Wyoming, uh, Miami, all of Florida, all of our real estate uh, laws are deeply affected by lobbying of those who don't want to change the situation. They are okay with the idea that a very high proportion of the highest um, value apartments bordering on Central Park were bought for cash by LLCs with no transparent beneficial owner. So you go for a little walk around Central Park and you look up there at the Warner Tower and you have to calculate that the top 15 floors are owned by people who they know they own it, but nobody else can figure out who owns those apartments. They could be Chinese or they could be anybody, but some of them, as the New York Times investigated, are, clear, are, are definitely Russians with names. So the impact on, on the West is quite significant, in my opinion. It's a definite weakening and an attack on sovereignty. And one could say that all of Russia's foreign policy is an extended attack on sovereignty as well. But we, we can talk about that in the <coughs> Q&A. The impact on Russia is, I think, also um, probably going to be negative, but it has some possibilities. So here's the, here's the, here's the uh, short version of the extended argument that one of the big impacts and understudied impacts of globalization is that while we previously thought that over time uh, economic interests would embed themselves and produce a demand by the emerging middle and upper middle classes for law, that hasn't happened in Russia because the, let's say, the economic elites have been able to continue to have a maximum benefit short term for predation in Russia and have long term security by using our institutions. They don't need institutions in Russia. And in fact, the introduction of institutions in Russia would decrease their benefit as it does everywhere else. I mean, our turn of the century uh, ultimate attack on monopoly decreased the benefit to those people who built uh, railways to this part of the world, right? They didn't want it. They were dragged kicking and screaming into it. But the government, our government, was not controlled by them. So law was introduced that controlled this avarice. In Russia, they control the, the, the rules, and they prefer to live by rules, it's rational. Because they can maximize their benefit, they can keep competition out of the, of the market, they can control market entry and exit, exit me meaning raiders when you go to jail, um, while they have their children, their wives, their property, their money, protected by us in the West. So globalization has actually allowed this. And it's something that political science absolutely did not predict. And one of the problems for Russia, I, initially I was, I was playing with the idea that 
well, maybe this Putin's objective to de-offshoreize uh, Russian money, telling them, you know, bring it back, nothing bad will happen to you uh, after Crimea. Well, what happened in response to his, his call for them to bring the money back were two things. One is that he arrested one of the most influential oligarchs, Yevtushenkov, and, and, and took one of his, his subsidiaries. So instead of saying, nothing bad will happen to you, he took the, co the company Sistema, which is the largest Russian, was the largest Russian company traded in the stock exchanges of the West, which all of our pension funds were invested in, and he systematically destroyed 50% of its value in six months by taking over a subsidiary, thereby demonstrating to the rest of the oligarchs that it would be highly ill-advised to bring any of your money back to Russia. And the, as a result, in 2014, capital flight increased to $150 billion. So he says one thing, he did something else, and people got the actual message as opposed to the, you know, purported message. And I think what's, what's, I mean, there are many very sad things about this, all of them to do with the Russian people. But I think looking forward, what's also very sad is that when we are talking and we're talking endlessly about how is this regime ultimately going to change, it's not positive when everybody on this side of the room and who own, um, well, it's not everybody on this side of the room, say the first six, six rows or so own about 25% of the wealth of the entire country, when they themselves identify their own long-term interests as keeping their assets outside of the country. How are you going to get this group to actually change the country? when the city of London is open for business. Uh, it, it, I, I don't understand what, what would be the, the, the ability of this group, how, we, how this group could change. You might depend on the back of the room, but historically, you know, people who sit at the back of the room, they're just not going to be active. <laughs> and as for this one row right here on the far right, which represents the, the Narod, I have no faith in them whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just think that this, the fact of globalization, not only in Russia, but in many countries, allows the economic elite to opt out of their own country. And that is true whether it's Egyptian or Saudi or whatever. Choose your elite. But it certainly is the case in Russia. I just wanted to give you a couple of slides of how the sanctions work. So... Sanctions are, there's two, there, there have been multiple rang, rounds of sanctions. The first round of sanctions sanctioned individuals, and these are just four of the uh, richest, or four, four of those who are close to Putin. And you can see in each case that each one of these people has a direct and long-standing connection to Putin personally from different circles, either serving with him in the FSB or in the KGB and in Leningrad and in St. Petersburg, or with him in Dresden in the KGB, or part of an economic circle that um, shared, shared money as part of the cooperative, under the cooperative laws, or um, received contracts from him in Timchenko's case. So those people were all sanctioned individually, which means they can't travel to the United States. It also means that all of their assets, if we can find them, are subject to asset seizures, if we can find them. But then in the second round of sanctions, uh, very much as part of trying to stop the Russian advance in eastern Ukraine, individual companies were sanctioned. And these sanctions are very similar, exactly the same in fact, as our current sanctions on Cuba. So. What it means is that you or I could go and sign a contract with United Shipbuilding 
the largest company in Russia for building ships, very obviously connected to the Putin, uh, to the Putin regime. But if we did that, we couldn't do business with the United States. You have to choose. And in the case of Cuba, you had to choose whether you were going to deliver goods and services to Cuba, or you're going to deliver goods and services to the United States. That's an unequal choice. That's why the Cuban sanctions have been really effective, um, although have eroded over, over time for many reasons. But Russia, it's a little more difficult because it's a more attractive market. It's a bigger market, and if you can get a contract that puts you very close to Kremlin people, the ability for huge gain is, is, is there. And it's interesting that even though we have these sanctions and the Magnitsky Act and all kinds of negative press, that um, Bill Brower, who, who wrote this interesting book about his own experience called Red Notice, he said in a recent piece in, in the Wall Street Journal, that he gets calls every day from people asking, is it time to get back into Russia? So Russia is a very attractive market. And there's huge amounts of money to be paid, to be made, if you are close to the regime. And you can see all of these, all of these um, asterisks indicate the, um, the companies that are owned by these individuals. And on the far right is the net worth, the estimated net worth by Forbes. So we don't know because uh, Chemezov is really a state employee only, uh, how much he actually is worth. Uh, there are pictures of, his, of a palace, so he's certainly not living on a, a normal salary. But at a minimum, this group is worth 20, was, at least was worth before sanctions, $22 billion. It's a very influential group. And there are 110 of these people who own 35% of all the wealth in Russia. This is just an example of what Timchenko's, I would say, charge sheet looks like, just interesting, on the Department of Treasury website. What I find interesting about this and why I put it up here is because, you know, Timchenko, he has three passports, as you can see. He's Armenian, he's Russian, and he's Finnish. And he has a, uh, he had a view of himself and a lifestyle which didn't suggest that he would be hiding in Russia and subject to arrest if he leaves the country. So this is a group of people who now appear on the, in the, um, on the Treasury sanctions list sandwiched between Iranians and North Koreans. This is not, I mean, those of you who know Russia know that this is not the way they thought this was going. They were flying in their private jets with their hookers into uh, French ski resorts. Uh, they go, to, of course, just owning the best parties at Davos, and so forth and so on. So this isn't the way it was supposed to end. I don't think it's ending, but this isn't the way they saw themselves. They saw themselves as people who were going to sit alongside the Koch brothers as, you know, People who build buildings in important places, uh, who, who are valorized at Kennan Institute dinners, uh, <laughs> we all know. Or, or who have departments or schools of government named after them at Oxford University. This is where they thought they were going. And now that has been stopped. It's no longer cool to be the child of one of these people. It's no longer cool to be um, at a party or doing business with one of these people. It's not to say it's not being done, but I would say the quality of their contacts has declined. So there's plenty of shady businessmen out there who are still willing to go into Russia, but it, it just becomes a little more difficult for somebody like the chief of Exxon to get on a flight to Moscow. He'll subcontract it to somebody else. 
and we hold it. This is a picture that's familiar to, I'm sure, most of you. Just a, a picture of who they all are from the Financial Times. Not all of them, but the, a group of the closest people uh, around Putin. Interesting story today. So, this guy, Viktor Ivanov, um, was head of Putin's, the presidential administration's personnel department for until last year, for 14 years. And he, he was head of the administrative department of the St. Petersburg mayor's office. And in one of the documents in the current Litvinenko inquiry, <laughs> he's the, his business dealings have been detailed in great depth uh, and indicates that he was smuggling. Um, he was, of course, in charge of the FSB department for smuggling, to counteract smuggling, because that's the way this works. He was, he was smuggling in St. Petersburg, Cali Cartel cocaine into St. Petersburg and then delivering it through the St. Petersburg port into Europe. So, not a very upright citizen. So I've talked about the other aspect of so what. Wealth inequality is increasing all over the world, including in the United States. But one of the things we can say about the 1%, first of all, we hate them. But in addition to that, uh, the concentration of wealth in Russia is infinitely larger than in the United States. There are millions of people in the 1% in the United States. There are 110 in Russia. This makes the logic of any kind of transformation much more challenging. And this gap between rich and poor in Russia is larger than in any country of the world. We're not talking about Europe. We're talking about any country in the world, including the British Virgin Islands, including Nigeria, including any country in Africa you want to name. What's startling about that is that, I mean, I certainly don't miss the Soviet Union. I know many people don't miss the Soviet Union. I know some who do, uh, including in our profession. Uh, but the Soviet Union had relatively low, compared to Western capitalist countries, wealth inequality. And they have more than made up the gap. And they've done it very quickly. Now, yes, it was, it's, this process started for sure under Yeltsin, but the argument of my, of my book was it, that, is that it wasn't just Berezovsky who was doing this, it was also this group in Petersburg, that they also were involved in the acquisition of wealth, and that when Putin came to power in 2000, one of his fundamental efforts was to take money from the Yeltsin loyal oligarchs and transfer it to the Putin loyal oligarchs. The system, it at, in that respect, did not change that much. And we all know the annual cost of corruption in Russia. It's, it's huge, and it's, this is actually a, a low number, and Transparency International hasn't done this study in, since 2007. But um, the deputy director of Transparency International, who's now at Miami, um, not that easy to do this work in Russia, uh, calculates that this number is now at least triple this. So the annual cost of corruption in Russia is just completely out of control and is producing now with it the decline in the economy, of course, increasing and largely, huge, hugely destabilizing um, unemployment, un underreported unemployment. So these are my conclusions, that it, it matters that we treat Russia as a, the system that it is. It matters that we don't jump to the gun. And I mean, you won't find anybody who dislikes Putin more than me, maybe. Although, although it's becoming quite a competition. <laughs> um, it matters that we decide what kind of system this is. Because you can't just have policy toward Russia with, without understanding what you're trying to achieve, and what kind of system you believe that you're, you're seeking to change. Um, and I also think that we need to accept that changing this 
from a kleptocracy to something where wealth inequality is less, where the system is more uh, robust and one that <coughs> reduces the circulation of elites as opposed to the non-circulation of elites is an extremely long-term project. But you know, it would have been possible to have given that prediction also in probably June of 1991. <laughs> so one doesn't know with Russia, things could happen quite quickly. However, I also think that the system is here to stay for quite a while. Mm. Thank you very much. So, Karen, in talking about why it matters, uh, would you be able to say a little bit more about the way in which Russia, and the Russian money abroad, is being used to affect the choices of major political figures all across Europe? Let's say the odious examples of Schroeder uh, accepting a position, you know, that, that, you know the, the Nord Stream project, but the way in which various figures across the spectrum, uh, influential figures in European politics are somehow uh, becoming connected with this corruption in an effort to alter the policy choices that are being made and in order to divide uh, the EU and prevent the um, fulfillment of certain projects. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's of course an extremely critical question. and. There's a lot of evidence that uh, energy is used not just as a stick to beat the Ukrainians, but also as a carrot. Uh, not so much in this case with the provision of gas and, and, and oil, but with the um, Russian participation in tenders. So. I found quite a number of examples of Russians, Gazprom or, or other energy companies, participating in tenders that they win at conditions that are simply economically impossible. So for example, there was, and Serbia is of course one of the countries that's being undermined with good old fashioned cash. Um, there was a tender for an oil refinery in Serbia. And the Russians won the tender, despite the fact that the Poles put in a more competitive bid. And I think the Hungarians or the Czechs, I forget, also put in a more competitive bid. It was given to the Russians. And the Russians, that's one example, but if you look at what was the proposed route of South Stream, they were marching uh, with their cash across Europe and, and building a route that went through every single country whose politics they wanted to corrupt. I mean, that, there's no possible way that route could have been justified except by politics because it, it went zigzag everywhere and it's just, you know, you didn't need to do it. So that they were buying off politicians and doing it through these um, tenders that were crazily put together and, and also promising that there would be trans millions of transit fees when South Stream went online and so that there would be a gravy train for these politicians in perpetuity. And so when he pulled the, the plug on South Stream without any warning, it was very interesting to see that these right-wing pro-Putin politicians quickly uh, complained, and some of them went to Moscow, and they got they came back with sweet deals. So with Putin promising that you know they would make it, they would make up the investment. What does that mean? You know, you don't you don't need the pipeline, you don't build the pipeline. Probably we are doing the same, but I mean the oil companies, our oil companies do the same. So we've got a, a real problem, but I think. Serbia, I mean, in, in terms of tenders that are phony or crazy, Hungary, Serbia, 
um, Greece, well, the North Stream is an entire, entirely corrupt project, entirely. Hi, uh, do you think there's anything to the wild speculation that the drop in oil prices is an orchestrated um, attempt by the U.S. and the Saudis to hit Russia? And uh, then I guess the second part of the question is independent of whether there's intentionality uh, behind the, the drop in oil prices, to what extent is it actually hurting Putin and his regime? Well, the Russians believe it, which is great for us, because it means we're really powerful. We probably can't tell the Saudis to do anything. The Saudis have their own reasons to <coughs> lower prices, which is to undermine our fracking. Um, so it's better for all for everybody concerned if the Russians believe that we're powerful and we can say that we were behind it. But I really I doubt it. Um, ha having said that, they believe it because we did conspire with the Saudis in the early '80s to to lower the price of oil. And when Gorbachev took took power, I mean the the price of oil had virtually collapsed. So they believe it. They, they believe that we've done it in the past and that we would do so in the future. Irrespective of the, of the conspiracy, oh, it's hugely important because the, the budget that went through last year was based on a stated price in the budget of $100 a barrel. They've had to reissue the budget at 50 And there just isn't enough money because, you know, after Putin disappeared for 10 days, he came out and the first two places he went was the MVD and the FSB collegium meetings of that week. And in both places, he chided them about corruption. You can't steal all that money and have money to pay the 85% of people who actually do support you and who you need to continue to believe you're providing for. So there's not enough money for both projects. One or the other is going to have to go. Short question. How do you explain Putin's 80% uh, plus uh, popularity? Not that the amount of billion in it, of course. Right, right. So, the popularity. I interviewed a uh, Ria Novosti reporter three years ago when I was working on this book who told me that she had been put under pressure to change the numbers, 20%. Still, if you believe that, 65% is very good. You know, so how do we explain the 65%? Well, you know, if, if, if we only had one, one propaganda stream of TV to watch, whether it was Channel 1 or Channel 5, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same. If you have a belief that your children could get a good state job and the, that the size of the state is expanding, then perhaps you can convince yourself that there's a future for your kids. Um, you know, there are, there are some reasons to, to believe that uh, there's the legitimate support. I think also the, the Russian people are amenable to several of Putin's central claims, which is that the 90s was a time of great insecurity. My argument is that it what is not that it wasn't insecure, it's just that he was also contributing to it. But they believe they choose to believe that the oligarchs were the source of that insecurity. And it's, it, I think, a very big part of the trope. Now, if on May 9th, and a day that I'm really looking forward to, you only have the North Koreans, the Tajiks, Kyrgyz, and Kazakhs, and some African leaders there for the May 9th parade, it might significantly under, undermine his argument that we've become a great power and are respected again. Maybe it's enough money for everybody. Not just the billion. That's very optimistic. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Mike Carson, and uh, I traveled to Russia quite a bit. I, I made over 100 trips here. And I want to make a comment about uh, Mr. Zolotha and why. Really, I don't think it's proper to criticize Putin for his employment of this person or this institution, mostly the institution. There is nothing that's more important 
than the personal security details around a leader. It dwarfs in importance everything else. And I want to point out that in Russia, the police was and is corrupt from top to bottom. So how do you assure that your personal detail, security detail, is safe unless you control it? And that's what he's doing. So I want to mm, ameliorate that criticism a little bit. And my second is really a question. If Putin had all of this interest in the gambling industry, how do you explain his suppression of gambling casinos in downtown Moscow? And I have to say, I was very happy when those garish, terrible places disappeared. I was actually in one sort of um, involuntarily. Boy, what an awful experience it was. When they disappeared, it was like uh, the, uh, someone had taken a cleaning brush to downtown Moscow. How is it that that happened if he had all of these gambling interests? It's a great question. So, um, Zolotov, I agree with you that there's nothing more important than the protection of um, the president. And I know that up until today, one of the continuing best channels between the United States and Russia is between those two services. So they, take, they both sides take it seriously, and they have, despite the fact relations have collapsed on many levels, most all other levels, in fact, that they, there still is secret service um, direct channel to, it's no longer Zolotov, but to, to that office. So I agree with you about that, but imagine a situation in which uh, our Secret Service chief was found to have a palace um, in the south of Russia. I mean, this is, a, this is somebody who has personal interest in making money off of the president as well. And so when you go to England and you, you go into a, I don't know, let's just say a sweater shop, um, Marks and Spencer's or something, and you, well, not in Marks and Spencer's, in another shop, in Harrods, and you see a sweater by appointment to Her Majesty the Queen, there is now by appointment to the president, the, to the Kremlin brand. And Zolotov is the one who's receiving those fees. So I would say that I think it is right that um, it's the most important thing, but there is a real problem when you allow your secret service, not only as evidently we are not going to allow, have hookers get drunk, but also to personally benefit off of your relationship with the president. That's so how you I don't keep them loyal. Oh, I mean, maybe. <laughs> um, the second question was, how do we explain the, the close down of gambling? Well, gambling preceded Putin in St. Petersburg. All right? So gambling preceded Putin. He arrived, and there, was, there had immediately sprung up illegal, well, let's just, let's just say illegal, un- of registered gambling. What Putin does is he controls it. And that's what he did in St. Petersburg. He didn't himself take ownership stakes in the gambling industry. He allowed them to operate openly with proper registration, and that cost them. So in Moscow as well, gambling wasn't being controlled by him. It was being controlled by Lushkov, and they didn't want Lushkov to benefit financially from that. And they were sick of Lushkov. Ultimately, Medvedev got the pleasure of getting rid of him. And so they cut off one of his, one of his major sources of, of, of finance and put it in federal, federally controlled districts, which means the Kremlin gets the registration. The Kremlin gets to decide who's going to be able to operate legally. So it, 
There is a there is a Putin aspect to it. Hi, my, uh, my name is Nadir Debanchik. I'm a uh, local correspondent for Russian newspapers. And my, uh, is it open? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And my question is, uh, did you come across any particular uh, example of a, like a, a lot of allegations that some of the laundering, laundered black money of Russian oligarchs come to terrorist organizations? from Hamas to maybe Al-Qaeda. Uh, Alexander Litvinenko was one of the uh, persons who uh, investigated that and uh, um, stated that. So, I think uh, the only uh, example that I found in, and I wrote about in my book, so it's there, is what I believe was connections between the presidential administration Berezo and Berezovsky uh, with Chechen leaders to uh, start a small and convenient and political war, the second Chechen war, uh, with raids into Chechen raids into Dagestan, which occurred in the summer of 1999 and were a prelude to um, the apartment bombings in fall of 1999. And uh, there is very good information that, uh, well, both the Israeli and French secret services monitored a meeting in the south of France in a house owned by, uh, if I remember the name, I'll tell you, a Saudi Hashogi, not exactly a funder of terrorism, but a major world um, gun runner. And they met in that house, the, the meeting was, was monitored and was written about. Uh, John Dunlap has written about, about it in his book on the apartment bombings, and I find his work on it extremely credible. And other people have written about it too, as did Lit Litvinenko, but I didn't I didn't follow Litvinenko on it so much just because I think, I don't know, all of his work is not so reliable, so I was more careful. But I think uh, there, there's very good reason to believe that at least that connection with terrorists took place, but it, it was not the oligarchs, it was Voloshin, Berezovsky, and Basayev meeting in the south of France to order uh, the raids into Dagestan, which served as a prelude to the beginning of the Second Chechen War. Hi, uh, I'm James Cameron. I'm a postdoc here at Stanford, and thanks very much for the talk. But I just wanted to ask you something about Crimea, um, because before Crimea, I mean, I'm from the southeast of England, and, and you know, there's a pretty good deal going, basically, which was the Russians would come, they'd spend a lot of money, we'd get a lot of business. Um, and, but the, nobody was going to do anything about the corruption uh, in Russia. But Crimea ruined that, not completely, as you say, but, but it really, you know, had, you know, undermined that deal pretty, pretty well. So how do you reconcile, I mean, if I were just a kleptocrat, then the last thing I would want to do uh, is to do something like Crimea, because suddenly there's all this pressure to, to, to mess this, uh, situation up. So, how do you reconcile the great power uh, element with the with the kleptocracy? Well, first of all, I think public opinion polls by Levada and others show that the Navalny message works. People routinely give eighty five percent support for Putin, but also in the same or in subsequent polls show that the number one issue for them is corruption. So getting people's mind off of corruption is a requirement for ma maintenance of the stability of the regime. And Crimea, who can argue with that? I mean, how many people went to Artek? How many people, you know, went to visit their grandparents on the beach in Crimea in the summers? It's something that is very organic to Russians. Of course, it was also organic to Ukrainians. So there, there, therein lies the problem. So. Uh, and I think also that 
it's somewhat of an indication that the Crimea decisions, and of course even more so the East Ukraine decisions, are an indication that the kleptocrats, they may have seen their day. That they, the, the, the regime it can't rely on them alone. And that they're going to need other groups and other messages to maintain the high levels of support for Putin. And that Putin, in a way, is pulling away from that group. Not pulling away from them, he's very loyal to them. Because after the sanctions, he, he even said that he would reimburse any of these guys like Rottenberg, whose properties are seized from the Russian budget. In other words, they stole from the Russian budget once to get those properties in Italy, and he's going to allow them to steal from the Russian budget a second time to repay them for the theft. For the, so he is still loyal to them, but actually he, his public message needed to be changed. And Crimea was, he couldn't have predicted that it would cause such problems. He didn't certainly didn't predict it. And I would say also, it also shows that he's relying on fewer and fewer people for decision making. And the quality of his decision making is just not good. And it's getting worse. My name is Gerald Thompson. I'm a retired investment banker with 10 years or more in Eastern Europe. That was almost my question, but to phrase it just slightly differently, <coughs> if Russia really is a kleptocracy, is there a possibility that at some point the oligarchs say either that Putin is asking for too big a slice for himself, for power, or that beginning, not only Ukraine, Crimea didn't help much, but then you start probing at Estonia, over flights in other parts of Europe, isn't there a possibility that the oligarchs may say, this is screwing up our profit business, and Vladimir is going too far, too much ego, it's time for him to retire. If it's really a kleptocracy, mm -hmm. isn't there a question that some of the things Putin is doing is spoiling the profit show for everybody else? Mm -hmm. Is there a possibility? There is. That they there can is. ask him to Absolutely. Um, but before we leave thinking there's hope, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, the kleptocrats of Russia have done nothing very bad for the financial health of the West, if I may say so. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people have got vastly rich from um, legalized transfers and illegal transfers in the West. So there's actually a lot of rah-rah support that the kleptocrats will win out at the end of the day, I would say. Um, it is probably more worrying for us that the kleptocrats will lose and be overtaken by the real believers on the ultra-right. And that will not be fun. So my name is Alyssa. I'm a master's student in the priest program. Um, so we've talked a lot about the West, but is there an emerging role for China to be, uh, you know, they have a lot of their own money also in the West, but they're investing, at least uh, rhetorically, in Russia. So is there a role there for, for China to, if uh, the places that you can store your money in your real estate in the West are drying up, is China or Hong Kong or Taiwan a place that they can be reinvesting? Well, I, I'll tell you a great little story. So when my book came out, the sanctions were already out, and I went to give a talk in the State Department. Um, and someone came up to me afterwards who worked for Treasury, and we talked about it various things. And he said that they had been monitoring, we all know that when they, when they say that, they really mean it, that they had been monitoring money flows from Switzerland the night the EU sanctions were introduced. And the money from Switzerland flowed not back to Russia, it, flew, it flowed to Dubai and Hong Kong. 
So they are not, it is interesting, they are not taking that money back to Russia. <laughs> they, they regard it as less risky to have it in Hong Kong than to have it in their own country. A system which they understand. And it's not for their lack of understanding that they're not going to take it back to, Hong, to uh, Russia. So that's one. The other is that I loved the t your word, use of the word rhetorical. Because one of the responses to our sanctions was to sign this raft of agreements between Russia and China. And Putin even stayed on an extra day and he wasn't going to go home. He, he signed, he's, he got all of these pipeline deals. And they've even, you know, he even signed his signature several months later on the first link in the pipeline and so forth. Well, what is the status of all those agreements? I mean, I think they don't exist. I think that they were political statements, like just to communicate at the end of a political meeting, and that the, the Chinese have, you know, some interest in showing that they're a triangular, you know, that it's still a triangular relationship, Russia, China, US, but they're not gonna do business with the Russians. That would be crazy and irrational. At least not in the terms that they were willing publicly to give Putin. So the deal is not done my understanding is the deal is not done and that they will negotiate the terms down to the last little bit. bit. If, if Putin really wants it, he's going to have to pay for it and it'll come in at a loss for him. So this is, you know, that those deals with China are not an economic solution. They are a political exit for Putin from sanctions with the West, but they are not going to prov provide anything. According to the people I, I talked to who are energy economists in Russia, they believe that those, those are not real agreements and that nobody's working on them seriously in Russia because nobody has the money to actually implement those agreements with China. Before we thank uh, Professor Dewisha, I would like to just to say that we invited her for two reasons. One, always interesting uh, to hear her insights. The other is that something that was not mentioned that her book is basically banned in Europe and we had also today in Canada because of Russian pressure. So go to Amazon.com that is still an American business and do it. And this is our little community service in helping the freedom of discussion in our field. And so, send it to people in Russia. Why do you <laughs> so, thank you so much for joining me.